Uh, I love New Year. New Year is an amazing thing. And, and friends, listen, at both of our campuses and those joining us online, I'm telling you, I just believe that, that today, today could be the beginning of something very very special in your, in your life. I mean, I really do because uh, I know like people go to church and you hear in church talk all the time, that changed my life. And you're like, it didn't change my life. But I'm telling you, what we're talking about today and what we're gonna be talking about in this series, it literally could change the trajectory of every part of your life. And I love New Year's because New Year's is a time of new beginnings. Anybody? Right? You can, uh, you can set these new goals. I, I just think that people want something different. I, want, I think they want something more. I think they're ready for a change. And, and I think a whole bunch of people, I think a whole bunch of people understand that they want a different set of priorities in their life. And they're open to hear from God. They want something different and they know that, that God has to be in the middle of it all. Their relationship with God has to be at the top of it all. And, and so a whole bunch of people are ready to hear from God in a different sort of way. Anybody with me so far? Come on, you with me? Taylor Campus, come on, you with me? And, and friends, listen, listen, listen. And today's message, I'm so excited about it. I'm just pumped up about this subject matter because I really do believe if we apply this, this could change who we are. And anybody in the room looking for a change? I mean, I think so. I think almost every one of us says that there is something in our life that we need to change. And so we're calling this series Beginnings, Endings, and the Space Between. Come on. Come on. The beginnings, beginnings, endings, and, and the space between. We're going to talk about how, the, how we need new beginnings, right? There are, there are all of us in this room, we need to start some new things in our life. We have to get some things going. And, and truth is, it, we, we, we know this. Truth is, we've tried this before, and, and sometimes it just hasn't taken root in our life. But we, we know internally that we need to start some new things. Anybody in the house with me on that so far? We need some new things in our life, some different sort of things. And, and so we're going to talk about the power of new beginnings and the, and the power of habits and direction in our life and the power of doing right things consistently in our life. And then we're going to be talking about endings, right? And it's about, it's about how sometimes we know that we need to move on. Anybody? Sometimes something has to come to an end. And, and the truth is that there are things in our life that we go, this thing has been beating me down for far too long and I'm done with this thing. This thing has been holding me back for far too long and I am done with this thing. We need to end some things in, in, in our lives. And so this is about beginnings and endings and, and the space between. And listen to me. And the space between is about your next step with God. The space between is what you have to do to make some of these beginnings and endings come to life in your life. The space between is your next step with God. So anybody with me so far? Come on, anybody? Um, I am so excited. And I want to tell you right off at the very beginning here uh, that there are a lot of writers and a lot of preachers and a lot of books that have influenced my thinking about this whole idea of habits and starting and stopping things and all of that sort of a thing, resolutions, and, and there are a whole bunch of them. And I just want to kind of give credit to them at the very beginning. I've been reading a book or listening to a guy online. Uh, it's amazing. His name is Darren Harvey, or Hardy, and uh, he is the publisher of Success Journal. I don't know if you're ever you know, into that or if you've seen his stuff online, uh, but he wrote a very compelling book, just an incredible book called Compound Effect or The Compound Effect. And I'm telling you, wow, like I am going to have my children read this book. It is so good. And it's this whole idea that it's those little things done right over and over. Uh, that's where success is built in life. So it's so good, right? And another guy I've been reading a lot of, his name is Charles Dulig, and uh, he wrote um, probably the, the all-American classic writing on the idea of habits. He wrote a book called The Power of Habit. Anybody ever hear of it? The Power of Habit? Uh, incredible, incredible work. Uh, and then there's guys like Pastor Craig Rochelle and uh, Pastor Rick Warren and Pastor Andy Stanley. A whole bunch of these guys have just been so influential in my thinking about this idea of resolutions and habits and beginning and ending and all that kind of stuff. And so if you hear me say something or if you see something and you go, oh, I think I read that in a book somewhere or I think I saw that online, you probably did. It was probably one of these guys uh, because they are so good at writing. I just want to make sure uh, we give credit to these writers and authors for the work that they have done out there. Y'all with me on, on that? Are you good? 
Am I good? So I, I wish, I want to start like this, and I wish I could say this is a completely original thought, and it, but it's not at all. Uh, but Pastor Craig Rochelle says this about habits. He says, why are habits so important? Here's what he says. He says, he says, successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Come on. Maybe you didn't all hear that. He, he says, you want to know the power of habit in your life? He says, you got to think of it like this. He says, successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Successful people, and it doesn't really matter the area of life, but you think about any area where you admire somebody's success, they do something consistently that most people don't do. They don't. Uh, and it doesn't really matter. If you got somebody who is uh, in their walk with God, if they're, if they're thriving and you look at them and you go, there's something there that I want. There's something there that I want to emulate. My guess is, is that they're doing something consistently in their life that you're not doing in yours. They're doing some things that are driving them regularly to the heart of God. Now, you take the idea of, of finances, right? You look at somebody who says, uh, I, I, you know, they're, they're successful with their money. And I don't mean rich. I just mean they, they're not a slave to the bills, right? They're, they got some financial freedom about them, and, and they, they're able to live generously. You, you look at those people. They're doing something consistently that other people are not doing consistently, right? They're doing some things right consistently over and over that other people may not be doing at all. And it doesn't really matter the area. It could be relational. Uh, it could be intellectual. It could be emotional. Uh, it can be physical. But if somebody is successful in almost any area of life, they do consistently what other people only do occasionally. And I bet on top of that, if you could peel back the layers behind somebody's success, here's what I think you will see. You will see that they do little things consistently that lead them to very big things. We think, well, they must have just landed the score because they're so good at that, or they were born that way. No, 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 no. Almost every time you peel back the, the layers, you will see successful people doing little things consistently while other people just simply don't. And, and so I want you to think about some things. If you were to look at the, the pages of scripture, uh, I would argue with you that uh, Jesus was a man of great habit. You, you could say this. Would, would you agree that Jesus was somebody who, who pleased the heart of God? Anybody in the room? Yeah? Pleased the heart of God? And, and it would be very easy uh, for Jesus to be like a lot of us. Like, we want to please the heart of God, but, but we make all these excuses. But let me tell you something. Jesus never went like, doggone, I'm just too busy. Right? Jesus never went like, these people are driving me nuts everywhere I go. There's people just lined up and they're... Peter is on my nerves, right? Like he, he never was like, I am so tired, I am so busy, I don't have time with God my Father. One of the things that you will see, friends, listen, if, if you were to dial this in, if you want success, even in your spirit, you'll see that Jesus had some habits where no matter how busy he was, no matter how crazy he was, and I'm thinking that Jesus was a little bit more in demand than you are. Right? Can we agree? Yeah, and, and yet, he regularly, as a habit, pulled away and spent time with his father. He, he, he purposely quieted his soul and reconditioned his heart be, before God. And I like what a guy named uh, Sean Covey, I don't know if you ever heard of his father, Stephen Covey, but he wrote the book, uh, I think, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Well, his son is a writer, Sean Covey, and he writes this. This is great. He says, our habits will make us or break us. We will become what we repeatedly do. Is that true? We become what we repeatedly do. And you'll probably acknowledge that uh, New Year's is a great time for resolution, right? And there's something in the New Year's spirit where you're going, start over, baby. This is my year. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like you just, it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter. But when that like ball drops and the whole deal, there's something like, there's something in the air that goes, the New Year's resolutions are good. And some of y'all go, I'm too cool to make a New Year's resolution. No, man, New Year's resolutions are great. And, and, and we, we make them. I think that's a good thing. But here's the bad news. Here's the bad news. Almost every single study I could find, every single one of them said the same thing. That about anywhere between 90 and 92% of all New Year's resolutions are foregone by February 14th, Valentine's Day. 
boom, right? Something's broken. We're not going where we want to go. We're not becoming who we want to become. And so let's just be honest. Uh, show of hands, both campuses, show of hands. So listen, Taylor, go with me. Go with me. Listen, how many would say in the past, in the past, I've made some New Year's resolutions? Anybody? Hands up all over, hands up all over. Let's be honest. How many would say, yeah, and it didn't go so well? Didn't go so well? Okay, let's get really honest. How many have made a New Year's resolution for this year? For this year, and you're like, what, day 10, day 11? It's already gone. Anybody? Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about then, right? Um, and most of us have done this. We have all committed to something, and we just didn't see it come to life. Am I right? It, it's true of your life and, and of my life. And, and it, it kind of connects us to this guy in the Bible. His name is Paul. And, and I'm going to read a section to you out of the book of Romans. I'm not kidding. You're going to go, what? This guy is in my head. This guy is like, he's living my life. You're going you're gonna to see you in these words. I promise you. I promise you. Okay, now listen. This is what he says. He says this in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 7, verse, starting in verse 15. We're going to kind of skip through a few of them. He says it like this. I do not understand what I do. Don't you dare tell me like you haven't like lost your cool, your anger, your your temper, your you've you've lost your integrity for a moment, you lost what you thought you were for a moment. Anybody go like, I have no idea what just happened right there. And you go back and you're like, what, what, what? Because that's not who I want to be. And Paul says it like this: He goes, I don't even understand what I do. I'm lost. I'm totally crazy. For what? Listen, he goes, for what I want to do, I do not do. For what I want to do is stop eating junk food, and I say, I want to stop procrastinating. And he says, I want to stop overspending at Target, whatever it is. He says, there are all these things that I do not want to do. But probably just like you, he says, but I do them anyways. I do what I actually hate to do. And I don't know why. There's something broken inside of me. Uh, anybody in the room have the best of intentions? Come on, we all do. We start on these journeys, our education, our remodeling projects, our health, whatever it is, our finances, our relationship, our marriage, doesn't matter. We start with the best of intentions. And Paul says, I have the best of intentions. He's like up in my head right now. Like, I'm like, you, this is me. He goes, he says this, for Listen, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't seem to carry it out. I want to do good. I want to honor God. I want to stop this addiction. I want to stop this habit. I want to stop this sexual sin or whatever it is. He says, I, I want to. I swear to you, my intentions are good. I want to honor God, but I just, come on, I can't. I don't seem to know what is wrong with me. There's something broken inside. Anybody tracking with this? Anybody identifying with this? Here's what he says, verse 19. He goes, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do. This is what I keep on doing. He was like, I want to do good, but I don't do good. I actually do the bad things I don't want to do, but I do the bad thing. I don't get it. He's all crazy. He's like, I, this is me. He goes, verse 20, he goes, now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin living inside of me. He's like, he's like, there's this different animal in me. Anybody in the room have part of you, if you're honest, that really loves God? Like you go, God, I want to I wanna live with you. I want to walk with you. I want to be in right relationship with you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like you have this, like, I want to change this. I want to honor you with this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be different with this because you want me to be this. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But at the exact same time, there's this whole other side of you. It just kind of throws everything right down the drain. And it's almost like there are two natures in us. It's almost like there are two animals living inside of us. And Paul says, I don't want to be this way. I don't want to be this way. I want something different. And then Paul, this great church planner, this man that God used to write most of the scriptures to us, he, he kind of does something that I think that Ultimately, every one of us does, and he connects his failures, his struggles, 
to his personal identity. He, he identifies those things that, have been, that he's been doing that he doesn't want to do, and he says, this is just who I am, right? He connects his failures to his identities, and this is what he says in, in verse 24. He just says it like this. He says, because I know I've screwed up, because I know I've done all these things I don't want to do, he goes, what a, anybody know this word? Wretched man I am. He's like, I, I, I'm so far not the person who I want to be. I'm not that guy at all. I am a wretched man. There's another translation that says I'm a miserable person. He's like, I'm an out of control person. I don't want to be this way, but that's the way I am. And it is not a good thing. And he says this little phrasing next. He, he says, so, he says, because of this, anybody identifying with this so far, this inner struggle? Anybody? He says, because of this inner struggle, this is what he says, who will rescue me from this body of death? Who will rescue me from this thing that is causing me to die on the inside? He's like, listen, he's like, there is this evil that is growing inside of me. This, uh, there's this change that I want to make, but I can't seem to make it. I've tried all kinds of things. I've done all kinds of self-help books. I've watched Oprah for like 100 straight days. I even watch Dr. Phil. I watch every doctor there is on TV. I go to counseling for crying out loud. I do the self-help books. I signed up for Weight Watchers. I signed up for Alcohol Anonymous. And, and I have a mentor and I have, a, I have three counselors. It's crazy. But nothing seems to work. You ever feel that way? I've signed up for CrossFit. I've signed up for this. I bought this. I bought... What? Why doesn't it work? He says something here. This is amazing. He, he just literally turns the corner and he says, it's because the, those, are, those things are good things. All those things are good things. But there's something under those things that's deeper still. Because those things in and of themselves will never fix what really ails the human heart. It'll never fix the brokenness of humanity. It'll never cover over the blackness of your soul. It requires something more than Oprah. He says, he, he puts it this way. He says, so who will save me from this? And then he says this, verse 25, come on. He says, thanks be to God. Come on. That's all y'all got? He says, thanks be to God. He says, thanks be to God, who what? Who delivers me through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. He says, there is only one hope. He says, I have tried a million different things. Pause real quick. I don't know if you're a church guy or not, but you have tried a million different things to fix a million different things in your life. You have tried to satisfy your soul with a hundred different things. And you keep going, what is wrong with me? There's something broken in my soul. There's a hollowness, a shallowness, a blackness of soul, and you just can't figure out how to cover it up. And Paul says, it's because there's a source underneath the source. You, you, you think that these things are gonna fix you, but they're not gonna fix you. He says, you know what's gonna, what's gonna repair a broken soul? He says, it's your relationship with Jesus. He said, it is your relationship with your Father in heaven who created you through his Son named Jesus. Jesus, he says, is our hope, amen? He says, Jesus is our strength. Jesus is our healing. Jesus is our direction. I'm preaching better than y'all are responding right now. Because he says, Jesus, he takes those things which are broken in our life, and he moves us in a new direction. And he says it like this. He says, because of Jesus, the old things in our life, they become new things in our life. What was once lost becomes found. What was once blind begins to see and comes to life. The soul part of you that was dead because of Jesus, listen, friends, it can come back to life. Yeah, yeah. you all with me? And so my prayer over not only this experience, but over the next several weeks together is that not only will you, you come into this relationship with Christ, but that you will develop the habits that drive you, listen to me, deep into that relationship with Christ. Because surface level Christian faith, church, playing church, playing religion, is simply not enough to fill your soul. It has to be deeper. It has to be something else. So we're going to talk about some things because, listen, successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Now, you all know what this is? Some people are saying a cookie. This is more than a cookie, people. This is, this is a glory to God, double chocolate chip, full four ounce 
monster cookie from Baxter's created in heaven <laughs> and sent to earth via downriver. That's what this is. This, that's, and I put this cookie up against any cookie in the world, and I am a cookie expert. I'm telling you, this is the real deal. Glory. Y'all with me so far? Now listen, listen. But, but this cookie isn't just a double chocolate chip. Glory to God, full four ounce monster cookie made in heaven, delivered to, to earth via the downriver. It's more than that. This is the devil. For, for me, this is a problem. Uh, it's, a, it's a big problem. And, and, and you know what we tend to do with our big problems? And you know I'm not talking about cookies, right? I'm talking about whatever the cookie is in your life that's keeping you from God. So the problem what we do with the cookies in our life is we go, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. And, and we tell ourselves, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to change this about me. You ever tried to change something about you? How did it go? Very hard, isn't it? Very difficult. And so we go, well, I'm not going to. And so what we do is we go, I'm going to put a little note on my phone. Do not eat the cookies. I'm going to put a note on my office door. Do not eat the cookies. God help me as I walk by Baxter's. No. And you can even go, this is responsible for 15 of the extra 20 pounds that I have right now. This alone. And you can say, I'm not going to eat it. But what do you do? You eat it. You eat it. Uh, in this book uh, called The Power of Habit, uh, Charles Dulig, he, he says some amazing stuff. He, he does this incredible, I mean, just incredible research about how the human brain works and, and how we make our decisions and how our everyday functions really come out in our life. It's, a, it's just an incredible uh, book. And, and he does something, he, he, he says it like this. He says, um, between 40 and 45%, of everything that you think is a decision in your life that you do daily, 40 to 45%, he says, is not a decision at all. He says it is a mere habit coming out in your life. And he's got all the data points to prove it. That most of the things that we think we're making a decision to do, our brain, if we could measure that activity, we're going to talk about this in the coming weeks, but if we could measure that activity, he, he says, you'll see that your brain is almost turned off completely with the vast majority of your daily functions. So there's something about the power of habit in our life. And, and the truth is, he reveals it in this book and many other books, he, he says that, that the truth is about you and about me is that, that, that more of our life is controlled by habit than any of us would care to admit. And so we need to figure out how to change something about the cookie habits in our life. We need to figure out what to do about this. We need to think about our lives uh, differently. And so uh, here, here's, we, we, here's what the scripture says about this. I, I want us to get this. And I'm coming from a faith opinion. I mean, I'm a Christian. I, I try to go to God's word for my leadership. I don't know where you're coming from. But we can say all day long, I'm not going to eat the cookie, but we eat the cookie. And here's what the scripture says about eating the cookie. It says this in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 5. Paul is writing to the church that gathered in the city of Corinth, and it was a very Roman town. It's Roman-occupied territory and very pagan, and they're trying to figure out how to make some of these spirit life changes. And Paul says it like this. This is so good. He says, he says, you ready for this? Anybody ready? Yeah. He says, we demolish arguments. Oh, but it's calling my name. It's singing beautiful love songs to me. Um, I can't resist it. It's not my fault. It's so good. It is not my fault. They priced it so cheap that I just got to go get one. I got to help these people out. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. But here's what Paul says. He says, you need to demolish. Listen to me. You need to crush. You need to, to put an end to. You need to demolish every single argument that is calling your name. Anybody following with me at all? Are you tracking with me? Because this is good stuff. He says, you got you to destroy it because there are some things that are going to keep whispering at you. There are some things that are going to keep coming at you. There are some things that keep, like you want to move forward. It's like, not so fast. And it pulls you back. Anybody? He says, you got to demolish 
Every one of those arguments and every pretension, every pretend thing that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And you're like, God is calling you to be somebody else, to do something different. And you know it. And you know it. But there's this, there's this cookie. <laughs> it just keeps calling out to you. And you're like, woo. He's like, no, that's a pretend truth. That's not really true. It's not really true. There's something better. It's called the knowledge of God. It's what God wants for your life. And then he says this, and then he says this. So he says about you and about me, he says, if we're going to figure out how to follow Jesus, we got to do this thing. We got to take captive every single thought and make it obedient to Jesus. That's a big deal, isn't it? That's a hard deal. Anybody with me so far? So let's, let's get brutally honest and let's talk about um, some of the reasons why some people seem so successful at any area of life, and why other people just aren't. Can we talk about this openly and honestly? Why are some people killing it and other people getting killed, if you know what I mean? Why are some people moving forward with their dreams and their goals and their visions and other people just are stuck? So I think this is worth talking about. Anybody want to talk about this? So here it is. The first reason I think is this, the reason that some people move forward and some people don't. The first reason is that we focus on the what, but we don't understand the how. You're like, whoo, that sounds really good, but I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Listen, it's, it's this, the what versus the how. The what versus the, the, the how. You see, we, we focus on what we want to do, but we really don't have any other any idea on how to actually do it. So here's what we do. We get all fired up. It's like a new year. You're like, honey, it's a new year. It's like a new year. This is my year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop I'm gonna drop 20 and 30 days. Come on. Yeah. You with me, honey? Baby doll, this is our year. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna stock up some cash, and we're going we're gonna to buy a house this year. Woo! Right? And you're like, sugar baby doll, this is the year. We've been talking about it forever. Baby doll, come on. I'm fired up about this. We are going to start our business this year and we're going to be like the next Donald Trump. That's what we're going to do. This ain't your year. You're going to start a million things and you're going to be a failure at it just like most of the other attempts in your life. If, if you don't figure out the how. Because we get the what. We're like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. But we have no plan to get there. The how are we going to do this? Anybody with me? So I think we need to kind of rearrange our thinking a little bit about this because, listen, I think almost every one of us has very similar goals. I, I really do. Like, if we were to like take a survey of like 100 people here and we were to go, okay, what are your goals? I think we could probably categorize those goals and just into a few little buckets, if you will, right? Because every one of us really has the same type of goals. Uh, most of you would, if we were to go around, most of you would say something like, well, one of my goals this year is, I just want to be healthy. Am I right? I just want to get healthy this year. Now, it might look different for you over here, but none of us, none of us are going, yeah, this year my goal is I'm hoping to spike the cholesterol, the cholesterol like to the top range. I'm hoping to be like one breath away from a stroke. That's my goal this year. Nobody says that, right? Like financially, financially, most of us would say, well, I want to be healthy Financially, right? Most of us would say, well, you know, I want to cut the debt or put some savings away, maybe make some investments. Am I right? Most of us would have this as a bucket, you know? Uh, I don't know anybody in the room who goes, yeah, my hope this year is I hope to double up on my debt load and maybe raise my, like, I'm going to go out and, like, slam down those cards at 19, 20% interest. It's going to be great. What? Nobody does that. Like marriage, like you get into a marriage or a romance and it turns into something and nobody says I do like at the, like the whole ceremony thing going, you know what, pastor, what we're going to do is we're planning five, maybe six years of this whole thing. And then it's just going to, then it's, I'm just going to throw it all out. We're just going to get into this all out brutal beat down fight. We're going to end up divorced. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Nobody does that. See, listen, almost every one of us has these big buckets, and they're very similar. But can we just admit that some of us will be very successful in those buckets, and others of us simply will not be? And what is the difference? What is the, you, we all have the same goals, the what, but it's the how. 
There, there needs to be a different plan. There is, uh, there's this guy, his name is uh, James Clear, and he wrote a book called Atomic Habits. It's really good. And he, he writes this, and I just quote this, and this almost sounds harsh. I don't mean for it to sound harsh. I, I want it to be reality. He, he says, winners and losers generally have the same goals. Successful people and unsuccessful people have the same goals. Now think about it. Like, what, what's he saying? He's saying like, uh, like uh, let's say coaches, you know, or teams, like, you know, athletics. No, nobody, like, I don't care, like maybe from the middle school level all the way through the pros, nobody gets into the season going, you know what our goal is this year? We just hope to pull down fifth or sixth place. That's it. That's what we're doing, people. Nobody does that. Everybody says, I want to win the championship. I want to win the gold. I want to make it good. I want to, I want to build something here, right? That's, that's the goal, right? Every single time. Um, again, somebody uh, doesn't get into marriage just thinking it's going to fall apart. And, and, and James says the reason some people are successful and the reason some people are not is because, he says this, goals don't determine success, but systems determine success. Y'all with me? He, he, he says, goals alone uh, don't get us to our end desire. Uh, it, it's what we do over and over. The system that our life revolves around determines the level of success in any category of your life. It is, it, and I'm just gonna change this up a little bit. I would humbly submit to you that it is our habits. It is our habits that are our system. It's the habits of what you do. See, James Clear is writing to the business community saying that your business has to have these systems. And I would humbly submit to you that you have to have systems. You have to have habits that help you become who you want to become. And and so I'll say it like this. I'll say it like this. Maybe you want to take a picture of this, write this down, because I really think this is true. Your habits will determine how far you fall or how high you rise. Come on, Pastor Jay. That was so good. It's true. Your habits will determine how far you fall and how far you what? Rise. And some of you are going, well, preacher boy, I don't know. That doesn't sound very spiritual to me. I came to church to be spiritual and you kind of suck as a pastor. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Listen, this is deeply spiritual. I would challenge any of you to read the Bible And as you look at these characters in the Bible, read it with this lens, that their habits, their habits determined how far they fall or how high they rise in every single area of their life. So so for example, um, have you heard about this guy named David? Excuse me, Daniel? Daniel? Anybody hear about Daniel? Daniel and the, come on, lion's den. Anybody know what I'm talking about, Daniel? So Daniel... What separated him from others? See, he was enslaved in exile in, in the land called Babylon. And, and when he was exiled, all the cream of the crop people were taken with him. He was in the upper tier of society. But what we learn is something separated Daniel from everybody else. Something that was different about him that ended up causing this slave to become a great leader even in the land of Babylon, even during his slavery. What was the difference? I would humbly submit to you that he had some habits in his life that were different than everybody else. You want to know what they were? There was two driving habits that he had. You want to know? Here's what he had. Number one, he had the habit of not once, not twice, but three times each and every day to slow things down on his way to Walmart, his way to pick up the kids from soccer. Every day, three times a day, he would just pause and connect with his father in heaven. He would pray. He would just say, God, my life is busy. My life is crazy. My life is chaotic. I need your wisdom. I need your strength. I need you. So he would would purpose in his heart to pray three times a day. Now listen, if you did that, let me just ask a very honest question. Do you think your relationship with God would grow? Come on. Yeah, absolutely. Heck, if you connected with your wife three times a day, that would grow, right? I mean, whatever you put effort into. And he had the habit of putting God first. Here's the second habit. You ready for this? Second habit is this, is that he decided in advance, even in slavery, that no matter what happened, he would never, ever compromise his faith. Never. 
It didn't matter what they told him. It didn't matter what they threatened him with. He drew some line in, some, in, in ways. He said, I will not cross these lines. I will not do these things. I will not, I will not. And those are strengthened because of his habit of connecting to God. Y'all with me? Yeah. So these are habits that, that drove him, right? And if you want to grow your faith, if you want to be more faithful, you will rise to the level of your goals or you will fall to the levels of your worst habits. I think Pastor Andy Stanley says it something like this. He says, you are producing results exactly what your system is designed to produce. He's talking about organizations. You are producing results in your organization exactly like your system is designed to uh, produce. But I would say it like this. We'll just slightly change that, right? You are producing in your life results that your habits are perfectly designed to produce. Oh, that's so good. Right? Uh, if you have habits that, that are in your life that build your faith, strengthen in your, uh, your knowledge and intimacy with God, you will more than likely become the person that you really want to become in life. Uh, but here's the mistake that we tend to make. You ready? Here's the mistake. Uh, we, we tend to think, well, I want to change the result. I, I, want, I want to, I don't know, let's just say, I want to lose 20 pounds by Easter, or I want to, you know, uh, I want to get more organized, or I want to get rid of these credit cards because they're like a pet that's been with me for 20 years and they're driving me crazy, Right? So you want to change the result, but I would humbly submit to you that if you change your habit, the results would change naturally. Come on. If we changed the habit, if we thought differently about how we're going to talk and about what we're going to do with our money, our bodies, our health, how we're going to spend time and what are we going to do for entertainment or not do for entertainment, I think if we thought about that a little bit and changed some of the systems in our life, the very things that we desire as results, they would take care of themselves. So let me just say it again. Your habits will determine how far you fall or how high you rise. Uh, if the, uh, it's the what before the how. That is our problem. We, we put all the effort in what do you want to achieve? No, it's the other way around. It, it's how are we going to achieve some of this? Because listen, friends, the how will win over the what every single time. And if we fix what we do, how we do it, the habits of our life, it will correct the problems naturally. Amen. 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 So why don't we succeed? I think the first one is that we get it completely backwards. We are all about what, not how. We need to switch that around. But here's the second thing. Here's the second thing. You may want to write this down. And we're just going to land on this. Uh, we, we need to focus. Um, uh, we, what we tend to do is we focus on the what before the who. Uh, it's, it's the what versus the who. We tend to focus on, on what we want out of life rather than who we want to become in life. Right? Let me say it like this to you. And you may want to take a picture of this because I think this is really, really true. Any goal that you have will be met by deciding who you want to become, not just what you want to do. Any goal that you have in your life will be met by deciding who you want to become, not just by what you want to do. It, it, because why? Listen, friends, here's what we do in our culture. All the time we say to our kids, we say to other kids, what do you want to do? Anybody know what I'm talking about? What do you want to do? What are you going to college to do? What are you going to do with your life? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You meet some random guy, you know, at Chipotle, and you strike up a little conversation. What do you, what do, you do? You ultimately get around to, hey, man, what do you do for a living? Right? And we tend to evaluate people, and we tend to categorize people on what they do. And we, and we think people are stuck in life because they've decided that this is what they do. That's not why people are stuck. I get stuck when I forget who I am. I get stuck when I forget who God says I am. When I get the, the what in front of the, the who, that's when people get stuck. You all know what I'm talking about? It's when we don't have a vision for what we can become. It's when we don't have a vision for about our days and about how we want to end our life. It, it's when we get caught up in what we're doing in the moment instead of who we're supposed to be becoming in that moment. Y'all with me? Yeah. This is, I, I think this is so true, and I think this, is, this would be so life-changing. It would literally set a new direction in our life if we would understand that how we want to interact with God and who we want to become in our relationship with God and who we want to become on this earth in our 70-something odd years, that will determine 
everything that we become, everything that we, uh, that we uh, can achieve in this life. See, but here's the problem, friends. We let our past determine our future. We let our failures determine our progress. And we start to think, well, I guess this is who I am. I've always been this way. And friends, this is a big problem when it comes to the people of God. Our distorted identity sabotages our future success. Amen? Amen. It's true. Uh, what, 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 are, what, are, what does our enemy want to do? Our enemy wants us to connect our identity uh, with our failures, our identity with our struggles. And, and so... Um, we, we, we say, well, you know, this is how I, I've always done, you know, bad with this. So I guess I'm always going to be bad. I've always struggled with this. So I'm always going to struggle with this. And, and I've always failed. So I guess I'm going to be a failure. And friends, listen, this is a terrible, terrible way. And it's a completely unbiblical way to think about life. You look at the scriptures. Moses did this. Moses was like, God, you got the wrong guy. God says to Moses, I want you to lead the people. And Moses goes, you got the wrong man because I have failed so much in my life. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. And God goes, I got better plans for you than you even have for yourself. Get up and get going. Come on. Uh, Gideon, Gideon, God taps him on the shoulder and says, Gideon, you're going to be the great leader of the armies of Israel. And Gideon's like, do you know who I am? I'm weak and I struggle with fear. I'm not a warrior at all. You got the wrong guy. And God says, no, Gideon, I got the exact right guy because if you believe in who I say you can become, everything in your life can be different. Even Paul himself, yeah. Even Paul, the great you know, apostle says, I am unqualified, God. He goes, there's a part, a couple parts in scripture where Paul begins to list his problems and his past and his failures and it's horrible. But he says, I can't stay here. I can't stay here. Because who God wants me is bigger than this. Who God wants me to become is better than this and different than this. Amen? And so how this might play out in, in our lives is like this. Um, well, this is, we go, well, I've always struggled with this. I've always, I'm, I've, and you know me, I'm all, I've always struggled with an addictive personality. So I'm just going to take one more drink. It don't matter. People go, well, I've always struggled with money. I've, I've always had a hard time with money. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to go to Target and get Walmart. Here I come. You don't want to put the brakes on. You don't think you can change because it's always been this way in your life. Um, people, you know, have this unhealthy uh, kind of past and they let it form their identity. And the problem is, is, is that unhealthy identities become unhealthy habits and unhealthy habits feed your unhealthy identity, Right? Well, I've never been super spiritual, so I guess I can't be super spiritual. No, friends, that is not what God says. Here's what God says. Listen, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he's still talking to this church in, in Corinth, and he says, uh, he says it like this. I know that you struggle with a whole bunch of things. He goes, I know that some of you have been like way up and way down, and some of the things that you've done are just scary in the past, but he says it like this. You ready for this? This is what he says. He says, but some of you were once like that. Woo! Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. Uh, you were made holy. You were made right with God, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the one spirit of God. He's like, listen, I get it. Some of you used to really struggle with this or that. He says, but that's not who you are anymore. You're different than that. Notice he doesn't say, yeah, 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 I know who you were and that's how you are. No, he says, I know what you were, but that's not who you are now. Because God has done something. When we come to faith in Christ, he literally gives us this new identity, this new beginning, this new start. Uh, and so there needs to be this shift in our thinking away from the what before the who, and it needs to become the who before the what, because if we get the who down, it will determine what we are going to do. Come on, right? And, and so what I think we need to do is I think we need to set some goals. And listen, they're going to be called who goals, not what goals. Who goals, not what goals. And some of y'all are like too cool to make goals. And like, you're like, I don't make goals, dude. I just am. <laughs> you, you, what? Like, do, do you know what you get when you aim for nothing? You get nothing. Do you, do you know what you get when you aim for nowhere? Where do you end up? Nowhere. I'd rather end up somewhere on purpose. You, you know what you get out of a marriage that you put nothing into? No goals, no dreams? Yeah. You know what you get out of friendships when you have no goals? You know, nothing. 
Nothing. I, I think we need to make some goals, but our goals are going to be who goals, not what goals. We're going to start with the who, not the what. For, for example, uh, let's say you want to lose 19 pounds, and by you, I mean me. I want to lose 19 pounds. 20 pounds is just too much because it's too daunting. But 19 pounds, I, I, that's my goal. Uh, that's my goal. That's my goal. But we're not going to get lost in the what. We're going to get around the who. And I'm going to tell you what the goal is, is I, I want to be healthy. I, I really do. I don't want to wake up sore every day for the rest of my life. I want to be able to play with my kids. I, I, I envision getting old with my grandkids and still being able to go hiking and boating and all of those things with them. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to become. And, and so listen, if we can somehow uh, get around the who, it will help determine what we need to do. Ask yourself, what do you want to become? You might go, well, I want to just be, I want to be a, a godly person. I want to be a godly wife, a godly husband, a godly friend. Uh, I want to be a great parent. Those are all great goals. Those are all worthy goals. They're big picture goals and that will inform once you get down in your mind what you want to become or who it is that you want to become, your next steps become much clearer. Am I right? Come on, am I right? You, you think about this. They, the, the who you want to become shapes what you will do. Uh, it's who before the what. Um, and, and when you look around, what you decide will determine about who you want to become will determine your next steps. And I, I just want you to think about this. Uh, if you say, well, you know what? Uh, I want to be clean and sober. And you're like, I'm like, that's a great goal. Amen? I don't want to be identified with, you know, addictive slavery anymore in my life. I'm done with that. I'm like, that's awesome. So if you want to be clean and sober, that's the who you want to be. Well, that should tell you that maybe you're, you're, you got next steps. And maybe that next step is for you to go to renew and get around some people who have done this. And get around some people who will cheer this on and help you take that step. Amen? Anybody with me? Uh, and if you're like, I want to be financially free. I'm tired of living in slavery. Well, well, maybe you need to get around somebody who can help coach you and mentor you a little bit. Maybe, maybe if it's a great goal to say, I want to be financially free. And instead of saying, I want to be a millionaire, I want to be a five millionaire. No, no, no. How about you just say, I want to be financially free. And if that's your dream, if that's who you want to be, then maybe your next step is to get a mentor. Maybe your next step is to make a budget. Woo! Maybe your, your very first step is putting God first with your money and just trusting him and saying, God, I'm all in. I'm all in. Some, some of you, listen, some of you, let, let's say you want to stop smoking cigarettes, right? Let's say you want to stop smoking cigarettes or you're trying to stop vaping or trying to smoke weed. Okay, whatever, right? Y'all with me? Let's say you want to stop all this. And uh, someone says to you, what do you want? You want, you want a cigarette? Do you want a, little, you want a little hit? And instead of going, instead of saying, no, I'm trying to quit. Listen, what have you done the moment you say, I'm trying to quit? You've identified yourself as a smoker. You've immediately put yourself in that camp and you're saying, I'm a smoker. That's what I do. And it's a real struggle for me. How about we try to switch this around and think about who we want to become? And you'd say, no, I don't smoke. I don't smoke. Amen? I'm not a smoker. Why are you offering me this? I don't want this in my life. I don't want this in my past. I don't, it was in my past, but I don't want this in my present. I definitely don't want this in my future. Get away from me, cookie. <laughs> right? Because why? You have a bigger vision for, for your life. Decide on the who, and then you'll know what to do what you want to change, what you want to take your next steps in. In, in God's word, it says it like this. It says, uh, it says, we know our old sinful uh, selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. Amen? Because, listen, without Christ being the source of it all, you try to take two steps forward, you're going to get yanked right back. That cookie's going to be calling your name. But he says, because of Christ's work in your life, you are no longer bound by the power of sin, right? It, it, says, it says it like this, that we no longer are, are uh, slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Uh, now you are free from the slavery of sin, and you have become slaves of righteous living. Woo! He's saying, you're different now. You're an overcomer now. You're, you're brand new now. Uh, he says, you're a conqueror now. He says, you're light now. You're no longer darkness. He says, you're, you're salty now. Woo, and I mean a good salty. He's like, he says there's something good in your life. The light of God is now in your life and you're no longer what you used to be. You're no longer a slave to that. You are free from that and you can move forward in your life and God has given you a new 
identity. And so we talk about like this negative identity and it's a spiral because like once you think of yourself negatively and then all of a sudden you're going to do negative things and those negative things make you think of yourself as more negative and like I've never been holy so I can never do holy things and I've never been spiritual so I never can do spiritual things. I can't resist anything because I never resist anything. What if we just stopped that and turned it around and said, no, I am a child of God. And, and you're going to start doing things that children of God, like for me in my life, I try to fast and I try to seek God regularly. I try to put things aside and I go, okay, God, I'm going to focus in on you for a little bit today. I, I, I tithe. I put God first in my money. I serve at my local church. I, 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 I try to love the people of God. I, I try to, uh, to, to do uh, things like pray and to read God's word on a daily level. I, I eat disciplined. <laughs> Working on it working on it, but I go to the gym regularly. These habits form a new identity in me. And when I, have you ever noticed that when you do good habits for a while, you actually feel good? Anybody? You ever do some good things like invest and, you know, even though you get knocked down on a couple stocks, you kind of go, well, I felt good investing. I'm going to try some more. And you know what I'm talking about? Like once you do something good, you run a half mile, then all of a sudden, like, I'm going to go for a mile. I'm going to go, I'm going to go for a mile, right? You're going to, hey, I said no to the brownie. Yes to the carrot. Oh, but it feels good once you do it a couple times. Because why? It's a good cycle in your life. Um, what do you want to do? What do you want to become? Who, who, it is, who is it that God's called you to? And so if God, I can tell you in my life, the vision for me is to be a man who loves his wife. Who loves his children. Who loves God above everything. Who loves his church. Who, who wants to serve people. This is who I want to be. And when I know who I want to be, that informs me of my next steps. It gives me a direction. Anybody with me? So this is my goal, to be someone who pleases God and 19 pounds. That's the goal. Y'all with me?